Please make as much noise as you possibly can for TJ, everybody. Let him hear. Thank you. I better be funny, that's a lot of energy. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming out, I really appreciate this. Uh, it's, it's funny doing this kind of show because there's a lot of people here that I know. Woo! You know, you're all very supportive, so that means within this crowd, there's a small convention of people that I've slept with. <laughs> so y'all can meet each other after the show <laughs> and swap stories. So, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm a whore, that's the point. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, I level with you guys. When you do this kind of thing, we're taping this. Normally, comedians will do two shows. They'll do an early and a late one. They'll do one just in case one sucks so they have a backup. That, that's what the other one is. I couldn't afford to do two. So, this is... It. This has to be the backup show. <laughs> so don't fuck this up for me. I don't have any more money. <laughs> now nah, relax, it'll be fine. Just get comfortable, we're gonna have a good time. Whatever the fuck happens, happens. Let's enjoy it. I live here, I live here in Brooklyn, I like it. For what it is, I'm not crazy about it. I don't love it. I'm not one of those people. People have to lie to themselves about this place. You know? This is the greatest place in the world. It is magical. Oh, uh, no the fuck it isn't. This is a very stressful and expensive place to live. You pay an illegal amount of money to live like a peasant and you get to brag about it. If you're not making six figures in this city, you're just a peasant with a metro card. That's all you have. What are you bragging about? Your bathroom is in your kitchen. Is that normal? You wanna take a shit while you're cooking? Is that the dream? Is that what you want? The big apple, that's what we call it. Why? Why? New York is nothing like an apple. An apple is a sweet and healthy fruit. It's good for you, that's not New York. I've never picked up an apple and thought, why does this apple smell like piss? Why is the homeless guy jerking off in my apple? This is uh, what I signed up for. This place changes you, you know? I've lived in a lot of places. New York is the only place where I've had to take back a smile. <laughs> you know how fucking weird of a moment that is? Because anywhere on earth you smile at a person, they know it's a sign of connection. You're letting them know you see them. Not in this fucking city. Sometimes you just have to creepily take back a smile. You're like, I saw this guy, he looked like he was having a bad day, so I smiled at him, and his response to that was, the fuck you smiling at? It's like, Jesus Christ, man. How much pain are you in? But that's your answer to a smile. When you live here, you gotta take the subway. That's a big part of it. It gets you places, but it's filthy. It's one of the dirtiest places you can be in this entire country. Every time I come out of the subway, I feel like I made it. I do, like my immune system gets stronger every day. I'm just dodging diarrhea and syphilis. Like I'm in a movie. You gotta be strong and resilient to live here, which leads me to this question. How does somebody live in the city? Every single day, you take public transportation every single day, and that same person is also allergic to gluten. That blows my mind. You are literally sitting on vomit and disease every day of your life, but somehow bread can kill you? That's what takes you down? 
You're too delicate for a biscuit, you weak piece of garbage. You're not gonna make it. Move to Kentucky or something. This is not for you. That's such a first world problem to have. I can't eat bread, it makes my tummy hurt. If you're allergic to bread, you know what that means? That means you've never been poor your entire life. Because bread is poor people's chocolate. When you're poor, you have to eat bread all the time. I'm getting used to first world problems because I'm from a place with real problems. We got real shit like, you know, I'm from Haiti. Like, here's a problem there. Some kid has deadly diarrhea. They got to take him to a hospital, but there's no car. So they rent a donkey, which takes forever because the donkey also has diarrhea. That's a real problem. No one makes it. You know what an American problem is? I'm an emotional eater. I eat my feelings. Don't laugh, it's a real problem. When I get sad, I get fat. What a luxurious fucking problem to have. Do you even realize what that means to be an emotional eater? That means you have so much food, you have food for specific feelings. This is sadness food, this is anxiety food, this is Game of Thrones, this is over food. Somebody breaks up with you, it's cupcake day. Your life is amazing. What are you complaining about? Remember food, the thing we used to use for survival? Remember that shit? Using food as a coping device. You're all coping with food. Some people in other places have to cope with having zero food. You know how they do it? By dying, because that's what happens when there's no food. Oh, what happened to him? Oh, he's dead. He's an emotional starver. He starves to death like a bitch. Fuck him. I have an accent because I'm from a different place. That's how accents work. <laughs> it's a lot of fun when you have an accent because you get to find out who's an idiot when you talk to people. <laughs> you do. This girl came up to me recently. She goes, you have a bit of an accent. Where are you from? I was like, I'm from Haiti. I'm Haitian. She goes, oh my God, that is like so cute. I have never been to Africa before. <laughs> I was like, well, that's amazing, because me neither. I've never been to Africa, not a day in my life. It's so far away. I was offended for a second. How the hell do you not know that Haiti is in Brooklyn? How is that even a question? I thought everybody knew. English is my third language. I speak Haitian Creole because I'm from Africa. I speak French because of a foreign exchange program uh, called uh, slavery. <laughs> Get over yourself. The rest of this show is just slavery jokes. So. <laughs> yeah, terrible program. I do not recommend it. It's too much to pay for French. It's not worth it. Try Rosetta Stone instead. It's much cheaper and way less traumatizing. I speak English now pretty decently, but I used to struggle when I first got to America. I didn't know the meaning for certain words, so I would make up my own meaning for them. I did. For the longest time, I actually thought the word penalize meant to hit someone with a penis. That's what it sounded like to me. I had no idea. My first week in college, my professor said, if you don't turn in your papers by Monday, you will be penalized. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I didn't come to this country to get penalized. <laughs> Just fucking bullshit. So I turned to the guy next to me. I was like, hey man, have you been penalized before? Because I have some questions. First of all, how, how big is it? <laughs> how hard does she hit you with it? Is it a gentle tap or a smack across the face? I need to know. Who does the penalizing? Does she have an assistant? Because that seems like an intern's job, you know? <laughs> you know what, never mind. Long story short, I dropped out of college. You're not gonna penalize me. <laughs> My proud Haitian man. Being in America for about 11 years. When you live here that long, you learn very subtle things about race. 
I was talking to a friend of mine recently, a white friend, and this is what he said to me. He goes, uh, hey man, I just moved, by the way, this is my white voice. I don't have another one. It's the exact same. <laughs> he goes, hey man, I just moved to Brooklyn and I found out that I'm white. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? What do you think you were before he moved to Brooklyn? And he goes, oh, I always thought I was raceless. I was like, that is the whitest shit <laughs> you could ever say to me. That is the most Connecticut statement I have ever heard. Of course you feel raceless, man. Of course you do. You're a young white man in America. You got courtside seats to life. A white person in America saying they feel raceless. That's like a lion walking in the jungle going, I feel pretty safe in here. <laughs> I don't know what these gazelles are afraid of. No one is trying to kill me. Stop having rallies and shit. That's the only thing that I envy that white people have, that raceless thing, you know, where you move through life and your race is not the first thing about you. That's all I want. You can keep everything else. You can keep all the quinoa. You can keep the Winter Olympics. You can keep Mumford and Sons. I don't want any of that shit. I just want racelessness, because that seems nice. I just don't know if it's possible. Not if you're black, because race is ubiquitous in America. Doesn't matter who you are, that shit will follow you. A while ago, someone vandalized LeBron James' house. The person wrote nigger in front of LeBron's house. And I'm assuming that person finished and went back to their minimum wage job at like a Cracker Bell or something, because <laughs> let's be honest, that's the work of a poor racist. Rich racists aren't doing shit like that. They got real racist shit to do. <laughs> like privatizing prisons. That's the kind of shit they're up to. They're not writing nigger on people's houses. That guy's an intern at best. He does it for the love of the game, baby. Just shows up with no confidence. Hi, I'm here for racism, please. All right, uh, welcome to Boston. <laughs> What are your qualifications? Not much, I just started. Mostly passive aggressive stuff. I get into a lot of Facebook fights. All right, well, every journey's gotta start somewhere, so good for you. Uh, who do you hate? You know, the usual, just the blacks. They're like, that's it? You haven't even made it to Jews yet? You need to diversify your racism, man. This is not gonna cut it in the 21st century. We don't have a paid position right now. Why don't you go write nigger on somebody's house? And that's what he did for free. <laughs> I was talking to my friend about it, the whole LeBron thing, and he said, I feel bad for LeBron. And I was like, I don't. Why would I feel bad for, it's LeBron James. That's King James, he wrote the Bible. <laughs> he doesn't need my pity. LeBron James is worth $500 million. That's a lot of money. That's the kind of money where poor people's words shouldn't hurt your feelings anymore. That's immunity money. If you call me a nigga right now, that would hurt my feelings. But that's mostly because I'm still poor. That's the real reason. <laughs> that's nothing to do with the word. Feelings are for poor people. Did you guys know that? That's all we have. They took everything. We gotta have feelings. Poor people have so many feelings. You ever take the bus? and see the amount of feelings on that thing. <laughs> Every bus ride in Brooklyn is the most aggressive therapy session <laughs> with all clients and zero therapist. Sometimes even the bus driver expresses his feelings. <laughs> but then if you flip it, you hang out with really rich people, they're so fucking weird. They have no real human emotions. They don't even laugh like regular people. Here's how really rich people laugh. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Very amusing. <laughs> and to be clear, I'm not saying money is the answer to racism. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is if money is worth anything, it should make you impervious to nonsense. What's the point of being LeBron James if some nameless faceless motherfucker could ruin my day with a word. I'm not doing that, are you kidding me? If you gave me a quarter of LeBron's money, not even half, just a quarter of it, I would go to bed every night to a recording of a white person calling me a nigger. I'll do that every night, <laughs> sleep like a baby. 
surround sound so I could hear it really well. <laughs> On a pillow made of money. I'd wake up well rested, look at my bank account and laugh to myself. Hmm, 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 hmm. <laughs> it's all still here. This is what I do as a job, as an immigrant, which is, you know, a little abnormal. That's not what our people like. My parents don't get this. They think I'm a clown with a microphone. <laughs> My mother hates this, and she reminds me every time she gets a chance. She called me the other day. She goes, I failed as a mom because you were a comedian. Which is some heavy shit to say to your child. Jesus Christ, woman, I have feelings. But now she made it about her and took the responsibility away from me and I could use that against her if I want to. If somebody comes up to me and they go, why do you do comedy? I'd be like, well, because uh, my mother failed. <laughs> it's not my fault. Clearly I was raised by an incompetent woman who couldn't make a doctor out of me, I guess. So I gotta talk to strangers on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Here's how dramatic she is. She followed that with, if I die, it's because of you. Don't even bother coming to my funeral. I was like, well, I hate to break this to you, mom, but that's not how funerals work. <laughs> Usually the dead person is not in charge of the guest list. <laughs> how are you gonna stop me from coming to your funeral? I'll do the eulogy if I want to. As a matter of fact, I'll tell jokes at your funeral. How are you gonna stop me? People get really sensitive when you talk about mothers because there's this assumption that if you were a mom, you're automatically amazing, which is bullshit. It's complete nonsense because mothers are people. People can be shitty, therefore mothers can also be shitty. You ever go on social media on Mother's Day just to see the lies <laughs> that people tell about their moms? Everybody's mom is a fucking superhero on the internet, just typing away nonsense. My mother is the greatest human being on the planet. She cleans up all the subway stations by herself. She climbs Mount Everest every year with not one, but two homeless people on her shoulders. She breastfeeds motherless puppies on the weekends. She hangs out with the most unfortunate people, lepers, cancer patients, and Republicans. She is so amazing. So really, your mom is amazing all the time. She's never done some crazy mom shit. She never got drunk and lost you at the mall. That never happened. <laughs> when you're five years old, you gotta explain to some stranger where you live. You don't even know street names yet. I live by the BLV. It's Boulevard, you motherless child. <laughs> Go home. Find an adult. I'm just saying that all moms are Michael Jordan. Some moms are just a little more odom. Sometimes that's what you get. That's how the cookie crumbles. She raised me very Christian. That's how I was raised. I was raised really Christian, and then one day I discovered fun. So that was the end of that. They have a very strict no fun policy. I couldn't do it. I like fun. I remember the exact moment I stopped being religious. I was a teenage boy and I went to this girl's house. Her name was Vanessa. And Vanessa let me finger her. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm never going back to church. <laughs> it's what I've been praying for the entire time. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for showing me the light. The Lord does work in mysterious ways, huh? Would you believe that? Religion takes away a lot of stuff from you that's perfectly natural, but you feel so judged. It's like God is, like God stop watching people. Just go do stuff in heaven. Let me live my fucking life here. Don't you have planes to prevent from disappearing? God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is a true story. I did not jerk off until I was 17 years old because I wanted to be like Jesus when I was a kid. I was, well, I was like, oh, Jesus isn't jerking off, so I'm not gonna do it. But the whole time my friends were like, dude, you gotta try this shit. <laughs> it is the bomb. I was like, well, what about Jesus in heaven? But you feel weird, because you know, when you're the only one who's not doing something, 
I was like, what if I die and I meet Jesus? And he goes, wait a second, you didn't jerk off, you fucking idiot. That's one of the greatest parts about being a dude. Why do you think your dick fits so well in your hand? It is custom made for you, bro, just you alone. Just enjoy yourself, have fun. <laughs> As a person, at least. Like if I saw an elephant jerking off, that would blow my mind because that's physically impossible. But as a human being, you're supposed to do it. I'll prove it to you. If I'm standing like this, there's nothing closer to my dick than my hand. I'm just one inch away from jerking off at all times. This is boredom and a good time. That's how easy it is. One Mississippi, and I'm coming already. If God didn't want me to jerk off, he would have put my dick on my back. So I'd have to reach out. <laughs> Fuck, this is so hard. <laughs> Vanessa, help me. <laughs> so I said, fuck it. I don't care if I don't get into heaven, I'm gonna do it. I decided one day I was gonna do it. I got in my room, I dimmed the lights, got some candles. <laughs> don't judge me, I'm very romantic. I treat my dick like a lady. And I did it, and it was the most fun I've had at 17 years old. I came and my knees almost gave out. <laughs> That's how hard I came, because no one told me you weren't supposed to come standing up. I didn't have that knowledge at the time. <laughs> but I'll never forget it. It's one of my favorite memories. <laughs> Here's how memorable that day was. Sometimes I jerk off to that first time I jerked off. <laughs> It's the gift that keeps on giving. It's, it's poetic, really. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> My last girlfriend was a vegan, which is a mistake. <laughs> it is, don't do that. <laughs> Food is too important in a relationship. You gotta be on the same page. She was black, but it felt like an interracial relationship. <laughs> I had to learn the ways of her people. <laughs> Most of her dates was just her watching me eat, then we'd go somewhere else so I could watch her eat. It's like we were swingers, but for food. That's what it felt like. I like vegans. I don't mind if you're a vegan because you want to be healthy. That's great. I just don't like the posturing, like this idea that you're better than me because you don't eat chickens. You're not. Chickens are dumb. We're supposed to eat them. Have you ever seen a chicken catch a frisbee? <laughs> or ride a bicycle? They're idiots, you can't teach them anything. <laughs> can play with them, can hug them, then I'm gonna eat them. That's my philosophy on food. Also, I don't think there's a difference between vegans and meat eaters, but I do think if society breaks down, the meat eaters are gonna have the advantage. We will, because I watch a lot of nature documentaries. <laughs> and you know what happens to vegan animals? They get murdered and become food for stronger and better animals. So if society were to break down, we're gonna be eating the vegans. They're making delicious meat for the rest of us. And when that happens, I'm gonna find my ex-girlfriend and eat her first. This time, she won't be coming. She'll be going. I put a cunnilingus and cannibalism joke into one and you guys did not appreciate it. <laughs> you are terrible people. <laughs> when you live here, you gotta go out to eat. That's a big part of it. Recently, I went out with some of my rich friends and uh, they go to places that I can't afford, you know? You ever go to a restaurant and every item on the menu feels like a life decision? You're like, if I eat here, I'm not gonna have a cell phone this month. <laughs> what are my priorities? Do I need this steak that I can't even pronounce? Or do I want you to call my mom so she can hurt my feelings? What do I care about? The waiter came, I was like, you know what? I'll have some water I ate last week, I'm fine. <laughs> can hold it together. And I learned something very interesting about restaurants. People with money, order food based on the name of it. That's what's interesting to them. That's all they care about. Broke people only care about the price. That's all that matters. 
Because when the thing came, my friends were like, I'll have the escargot, the sautéed quail, and the Cornish hen. And I was like, what the fuck are those things? <laughs> when it was my turn, I was like, I'll have the 7 dollars That's what I have. <laughs> I don't care what it's called. That's what I can afford. What is it? Chicken vaginas? Yes, I'll have chicken vaginas for $7.99. I had no idea how chickens had vaginas, but now I know. And I bet it's delicious if the egg is any indication. <laughs> One time I, I told that joke and there was a, I don't know what you call it, there was a chicken scientist in the audience. <laughs> I don't know the word. And she, she told me that chickens actually don't have vaginas. They have one little hole called the cloaca, and they do everything out of it. They pee out of it, they poop out of it, they fuck out of it. And I think that's why we eat chickens. <laughs> we have more holes than they do. <laughs> and in my book, that makes us superior. <laughs> I hope I didn't ruffle any feathers with that one. <laughs> that one's for the kids, it's cute, isn't it? <laughs> I'm 31 today. Yeah. A lot of my friends are doing the children thing. You know? So it's something I gotta think about. Now, I don't know if I wanna do it. Actually, I know, I don't wanna do it. That's what I know. I don't wanna do it. For a lot of reasons. First of all, it's expensive. I don't, you know, you can't feed chicken jokes to children. You have to find actual chickens. <laughs> I'm selfish, I kinda like to do whatever I wanna do with my time, so I, I don't wanna have kids and resent them because I'm no longer free, you know what I mean? You know those parents who are like, the children are like, Daddy, Daddy. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Should be on stage right now telling jokes, but I gotta wipe your ass and feed you because you can't do nothing for yourself. Get away from me, you useless little parasite. I love you. <laughs> but if I'm being, the main reason, if I'm being honest, that I'm afraid to have children is because I think it's a matter of luck. With kids, you don't know what you're gonna get until you get it. There's no recipe for good children. It's just whatever. Like it's not great husband, spectacular wife, and then you get blue ivy. That's not how it works. You could be amazing, your wife is amazing, and you make a piece of shit kid. And that's yours now to raise forever. You can't return it, it's not an Amazon package. <laughs> Having a kid is just like rolling the dice. You're like, all right, let's see what we got here. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> he plays with dead animals, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> could I be raising a school shooter here? Well, I'm black, so statistically, not really, but those are the questions you gotta ask as a potential parent. Kids are tough, man. Have you guys ever met an evil kid before? Yes. I have, and that's a terrifying moment, isn't it? Because there's a part of you you'd like to think that children come into the world pure, and if you love them, they'll be great. But I'm sorry to say that's not the case at all. Some kids come here evil little cunts. <laughs> and there's no amount of love that can change that. I used to work at a summer camp in New Hampshire and there was an evil little boy. Seven year old white boy named Jason. That's his real name too, fuck him, I'm not changing it. <laughs> he was really evil. You know when you meet a child with weird adult energy? You're like, you're seven, why do you act like you've been divorced before? How many lives have you lived, Jason? This makes no sense. He would do really mean shit to the other kids. His favorite thing after breakfast was just walk around and fucking slap food out of the other kids' hands. Just fucking slap their breakfast away. The kids get letters from their parents. Jason would sneak up behind them while they read them and fucking grab it and rip it apart. Emotional terrorism. How does a seven-year-old know how to do that? The final thing that he did where I thought, mm, maybe I should do something about this. 
one day, you know, I'm an instructor at the camp. I was going to play with a bunch of kids. So before we started playing, I said, hey, Jason, do you want to play with us? And uh, he said, nah, I'm good. I was like, all right, fuck you. We'll play without you then. <laughs> so I just started playing with the other kids, just with a ball, basic summer camp fun, just tossing a ball around. And at some point, the ball left the group and went to Jason, and he picked it up. And then he picked up a sharp stick from the ground, and then he fucking popped the ball like a serial killer. <laughs> he ruined everybody's fun, and then he maintained eye contact and then just squeezed all the air out of it. <laughs> just... <laughs> and it sent a chill down my spine. <laughs> And in that moment, I had one of the worst thoughts I'd ever had in my life. I'm not proud of it, but I had it. Have you ever thought about murdering a kid <laughs> for the greater good? <laughs> I'm a utilitarian, right? So if I kill this kid now, I'm saving thousands of lives into the future. Because that's how Thanos happens. I got to stop it before it happens. <laughs> And I thought about how I was gonna do it too. There's a lake at the camp. I was gonna take him there and when no one is watching, I'd just drown him. That was the plan. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a psychopath. I would be sad about it. You know, I'd be crying. You know when you watch a movie and the hero has to make a morally great decision? You're like, all right, don't fight this Jason. It's just the best thing for everybody. Just, it'll be over real quick. Just let it happen, all right? Shh. Just can't let you go up and destroy half of New Hampshire. Just sh take it. Shh. Shh. So I think I'd be a pretty good dad, is uh, <laughs> the point of that. I think I would. Because you only have two options when you're a dad. You could either raise your children, or you could leave. I don't know which one is better. It's debatable, really. <laughs> if you're an average kid, some future blogger, then stay, play catch with them, whatever the fuck you do. But if you want NBA champions, if you want Hall of Fame performers, then take a leave of absence. I'm telling you, <laughs> the amount of albums that have been made because some great dad had the foresight to leave <laughs> is unbelievable. When you see a deadbeat dad say, thank you for being such an inspiration <laughs> to somebody. It's not a new thing either. It's been happening for thousands of years. Look at Jesus. <laughs> he didn't know his dad until he turned 30 years old and it turned out amazing. <laughs> God was the original deadbeat dad. <laughs> and Jesus turned out damn near perfect. No one taught him how to swim. He got so good he was break dancing on the ocean. That's how good he was. He didn't go to bakery school. He made bread for a whole fucking town just throwing baguettes at people. He was the opera of bread. And he did all that shit without a dad. So it's kind of overrated is what I'm trying to say. I'd rather have no dad than a shitty dad. Because when you don't have a father, it gives you that special Luke Skywalker drive, you know? <laughs> trying to be somebody. People without dads do amazing things. Obama did not have a dad. He was the leader of the free world. Jay-Z did not have a dad, greatest rapper alive. You know who had a dad? Bill Cosby, he had a real shitty dad. <laughs> Just giving him way too much confidence, raising him in the shadows. Be like, hey Bill, you're my son and I want you to know the world is your oyster. You never take no for an answer. <laughs> I can understand why you could be mad at this joke. <laughs> but you gotta admit, this is a perfect joke. It's really well constructed. <laughs> I mean, the structure on this thing is impeccable. And the interesting thing is, there's no curse words in that punchline, which means Bill Cosby would approve of it. <laughs> gotta know who the real monsters are. <laughs> You're not gonna like this next part. <laughs> I love this job. I get to travel across the country. I was recently in San Francisco, really great town. The tech bros have ruined it, but it's a beautiful town otherwise. I went by the Golden Gate Bridge. Beautiful landmark, but you know, there's an ugly side to it. The day I was there, somebody jumped. 
to their death. And I was like, oh, shit. So I talked to somebody who lived there, and they told me that's something that happens all the time. It's almost a daily occurrence. It's a hot ticket. Here's how I feel about suicide. If you're young, you're in your 20s, don't kill yourself. That's dumb. If life is hard, it could get better. Just wait it out. If you're over 40 and you kill yourself, I think that's fine. <laughs> because that's an adult decision. If you're over 40, you gave it a shot. You tried this life thing for four decades. You've seen the internet, you've seen Michael Jackson, you've seen the first black president. If you don't already like it, you're probably not gonna like it. Maybe it's not for you. Not everything is for everybody, including life. I empathize with people who kill themselves. Life is fucking hard. The other day I saw a dog and I was jealous of that dog. Because he was so much better at being a dog than I was at being a person. Dogs are really good at dog. You know what I mean? Because, you know, they have a direct correspondence with their reality. But us, you just got to figure shit out. You think dogs walk around going, am I being the best dog I can be right now? Should I stop licking my balls? Maybe go to college, become a vet, so I could help my brothers and sisters in the canine community. Like, fuck that, I'm a dog. I'm just gonna throw up and eat it real quick. <laughs> People with college degrees get paid to pick up my shit. My life is good. <laughs> it's good to be a dog. The other part of this gig I really like is the people. You meet outstanding people. Not all the time. Sometimes it gets weird. Recently I did a show and I met this old man. He was 79 years old. He was really into my comedy. I was like, oh, that's cool. I have an old friend now. So after the show, he took my email and phone number. I was like, well, I hope that's the end of it. <laughs> but it wasn't. He called me the next day and invites me to his place for dinner. And I was like, all right, this could go a couple of ways. Let's go through them. <laughs> First option is a 79-year-old dude. His wife is dead. Maybe he's lonely and he wants to impart some wisdom on a young man. I'd listen to him. Maybe he has some cool old guy story, you know? Like he had to eat squirrels for an entire week during the Great Depression. I'd listen to that. <laughs> Second option, this is an old white man. Maybe he has a lot of money laying around and he wants to give me some of it out of guilt. I'd take that money. That's my personal reparation. I'd fucking take that. <laughs> the third option... I've been living in New York for a minute. So I know people can be into weird shit. So I was like, what if I go to this guy's place and he has six other old dudes and they're planning to gang rape me? <laughs> now I gotta think about this logically. I'm a pretty strong 31 year old. How many 79 year olds does it take to rape me? <laughs> the answer is five, it takes five of them. I thought about it. Four to hold me down and one to get the job done. And they could all rotate. Everybody's got to have a go. That's just good gang rape etiquette. I was like, is this what New York does to you? You afraid of a 79-year-old man? Could be your grandfather, for Christ's sake. I was like, you know, I should believe in people more, so I should go. I decided to go, but I texted my friends. I was like, all right, this is where I'm going to be. If at 9 p.m. I'm not out, call the cops. The elderly got me. But I went to his place and things went fine. Things went very differently from what I expected. He bought and paid for Indian food. We had a nice dinner. We had a nice conversation and then I raped him. <laughs> because the best defense against the rapist is a much quicker rapist. <laughs> so, beat him to the punch. That's my Me Too story. <laughs> The Me Too movement is three years old now. It's a toddler. It's a toddler with a lot of bodies. A lot of your heroes went down, white man. A lot of great whites got fired for dick-related stuff. It's a long list of people. Some were funnier than others. Matt Lauer, that was funny to me. because He invited a coworker into his office. Matt Lauer, the face of NBC, invited a coworker to his office. When she got there, he pulled his dick out, which is a technical foul. Jesus Christ, man, that's fucking flagrant. 
Time out, bro. Because not only is that sexual misconduct, but it's also a terrible game. That's your move. You've been on TV for this long. This is how you try to get laid. Has that ever worked for anybody? Has a woman ever walked into a spontaneous penis situation and was like, oh my God, is this for me? Thank you so much. That is so thoughtful of you. I didn't even know you had one of those. Oh my God. Felt bad for the coworkers, you know, the people that work with those guys because they had to pretend they didn't know that shit was happening. But you know they know. Of course they know. If you work with someone long enough, you know who's a piece of shit. They tell you when you first get to the job that, all right, welcome to CBS. This is Charlie. He's a good guy, but uh, he pulled his dick out on Tuesdays. <laughs> We're just letting you know. You don't have to work here if you don't like it. He makes us a lot of money. It's a terrible thing to happen to you ladies, so I support... The movement, I support your right to get people fired for that shit. I can only empathize with it. But I also think we should be able to have an honest conversation about why it happens so much. We should be able to talk about the fact that men are just creepier than women. <laughs> because we are. I can't speak for all men, obviously. But I'm sure there's, you know, there's guys in this room who never have inappropriate sexual thoughts about their core. Because if that's you, Good for you. Godspeed. But I'm not built like you. I'm not. My experience of being a man is pretty much creep management. You know what I mean? It's a skill that you learn over time. Some men are better at managing it than others. I'm a creep, but I'm pretty good at managing it. I've never done anything to get fired for, but up here, it's fucking darkness, man. I commit atrocities in my mind all the time, but no one gets hurt because it's in my mind. That's the trick to life. Not every stupid thing in your head has to come out into the world. Just keep that shit to yourself. Manage your creep. <laughs> Men are dumb, really. There's a lot of shit we could prevent if we made the right management decisions. We should have used a livelihood over some shit you could have prevented. My lawyer pulled his dick out of work and that cost him a $26 million job. Some people do the same thing. When the sub, it only cost them $275. <laughs> that is excellent creep management. I mean, the savings. <laughs> to just tweak the location of where you pull your dick out. Your kids could go to college now. Why we gotta be so dumb about this? But we all creepy. We're visual. You know, when we see something, it's just... I don't cackle women because I know that makes them feel unsafe. It's rude and it's intrusive. But you know how many friendships I made with another dude because we both saw an ass that was amazing <laughs> and we had to talk about it? Like, did you see this shit, bro? Fuck yeah, I did. You want to get a slice and talk about it? <laughs> That's how I've made all of my friends. <laughs> ass brings men together. <laughs> We are, we're creepy, we're, that's just a part of it. Look, here's the thing, right? It's not even about men and women. It's like when you're a person, the struggle really is between who you are and what you are. Who you are, that's fine, you know? You got your dreams, your values, your great, all great and wonderful things. What you are, it's different, it's creepy. You're an animal driven by procreation, that's a creepy thing. If you think about what a man is, biologically speaking, it's not pretty. A man at its most basic core, just a cum conduit. Just a giant FedEx truck full of jizz, looking for destinations to drop it off. It doesn't even matter what the destination is. A pair of socks, a different pair of socks, a cousin. I know. I'm not saying this to upset you, I'm saying it because it happens. I don't know how many people know this, but Albert Einstein famously slept with and married his first cousin. That's gross, but that's also Albert Einstein. So you get the difference between who you are and what, like a genius physicist, that's who Einstein was. 
What he was, just a basic cousin fucker. <laughs> How do you deal with that as a society? The theory of relativity might have been inspired by some sweet cousin pussy. How do you deal with that? <laughs> e equals M cousin squared. That's a possibility. <laughs> You know, sometimes I talk about that, about how creepy men are and women come up to me after shows. They're like, we're creepy too. <laughs> we're just better at hiding. It's like, Jesus Christ, how desperate are you for equality? This is not the Creep Olympics. There's nothing to gain here. It's not a fucking privilege, it's a burden. We don't want to be creepy. We just are. <laughs> women are creepy too, but it's not on the same level. It's not as intense. The women I know get really creepy and horny when they're ovulating. That's your call of the wild, ladies. That's when you want it. So I want you to empathize with our plight as men. So ladies, think about how creepy and horny you get when you're ovulating. Are you thinking about it? Now think about the fact that men are ovulating all of the time. We don't get a cycle once a month. It's a nightmare every single day of your life. You just wake up, there's tiny people trying to come out of your dick. Just an army of monsters behind a door. You have to try to hold them in with all your strength. Your mom is yelling at you, you're crying. Just trying to hold the door like Hodor from Game of Thrones. Just Hodor, 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 Hodor. Some of them get out eventually. You can fight them all. And NBC fires you, that's what happens. That's how it goes. I think people forget sometimes that we are still animals, you know? We have buildings, we have boats, we have bidets, but we're still animals. Animals have only one goal, survival. Survival is about efficiency, and that's unfortunately unfair to women. It affects the way we come. It's so much easier for men to come than it is for women, and that's something I feel terrible about, but what are you gonna do, you know? <laughs> it's really unfair. Like, a dude coming is the easiest thing in the world. All you need is 35 seconds and some type of hole. That's all you need. <laughs> if you carve a hole in a tree and put mascara on it, a guy will come in it. That's how easy it is. But the female orgasm is a whole different thing. Sometimes it just feels like you're trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. You're like, a lot of finger work. Like, Damn it, I was so close. What happened? Fuck. It's like trying to solve an equation. There's a formula to making women come. Speed plus intensity multiplied by trust divided by openness. I figured it out. <laughs> Now, I don't know exactly why it's easier for me to come than it is for you ladies. I'm not a jizz scientist. <laughs> but I do have a theory, and I'll share it with you because I have a microphone. <laughs> you wanna hear it? Yeah. I think the reason why it's easier for me to come than it is for you is because my cum matters more. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's hard to hear. It pains me to say this, <laughs> ladies. And I'm not saying you shouldn't come. I'm not a monster. I'm just saying, biologically, your come is inconsequential. I want you to come. When you come, it's great. But when you come, nothing happens. When I come, it's the next generation. There are future presidents and potential plumbers, little Beyonce's and Serena Williams all over the place. There's black girl magic in my come. You understand? When you come, you come for yourself. I come for the species. It's a responsibility. <laughs> I got in trouble for this joke before. Because, you know, it's 2019. Some people in Brooklyn can handle biological reality. And by people, I mean white feminist settlers of Brooklyn. That's who I mean. Those are the people. Some girl told me that joke was abusive to women. 
that fucking joke. Like, I didn't make this up. This is just a natural fact. Look, if anybody who is offended by this, let's do a real simple exercise. Clap if you got here on this planet because your mom came really hard. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Maybe nature is sexist. It's not me. Don't put it on me. You know, that kind of stuff can phase me. I'm an immigrant, you know? We, we're like more used to actual reality than a lot of Americans. A lot of people who don't know how to deal with shit. I remember how entertaining it was to be an immigrant after the 2016 election. People were concerned for my safety. I had friends call me, they were like, are you afraid <laughs> that they're gonna make you walk across the ocean back to your country? Are you scared they're gonna put your family on a raft and gently push you <laughs> away from America? I was like, not really, no. I get why you're afraid you're American. This is new to you. I'm Haitian, I'm used to this. I'm used to turmoil. You think I'm afraid of a shitty president? We invented shitty presidents. That's all I've known my entire life. I'm an expert at this shit. I can teach you how to survive this shit. Donald Trump is not on the list of what I'm afraid of. Here's what I'm afraid of based on personal experience. Hurricanes. <laughs> Hurricanes. <laughs> Stubbing my toe. Having diarrhea in public places. And then maybe Donald Trump, maybe. Not even. People were crying after the election, real tears. Mostly white people. Black people are like, welcome to the club, motherfuckers. <laughs> We've been trying to tell you about this goddamn country for decades now, welcome. We have a bucket right here for your white tears. Piss yourself. It's gonna be like four years, but it's gonna feel like 27, enjoy it. People were sad like America was gonna become a third world country the next day, which is insane. It's not gonna happen that quickly. Oh, it's gonna happen. <laughs> Just be patient, give it some time. Let's all get there together. Rome wasn't built in a day. Rome won't be destroyed in a day. Give it some time. And I gotta tell you, as somebody from a third world country, I cannot wait until America becomes a third world country. <laughs> I think about it all the time. It's my fantasy. Imagine if cell phones are made in Kentucky by white children. How fucking amazing would that be? Caucasian child labor, that's my favorite. <laughs> These shirts aren't gonna make themselves, Kurt. <laughs> What's that? Oh no, it doesn't matter who your father is anymore. <laughs> Those days are over, buddy. Now roll up your Abercrombie jeans and get back to work. Goes for you too, Brock. I can just see it, I can just picture a field full of white women with babies on their backs, just struggling in the sun with no sunscreen, <laughs> picking their own pumpkins, <laughs> singing cracker spirituals. <laughs> Don't stop believing. <laughs> Hold on to that. <laughs> Sing happy birthday to DJ, all right? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear TJ. Happy birthday to you. What's your name? My name is Adele. Hi, um, Adele. How old are you? I'm six years old. Okay. What are you going to do today? I'm going to reduce myself by doing some gymnastics. And I am going to do some gymnastics with my uncle, Tanayo. So I'm going to be laying on his back first by doing a thing like Sophie does. Who's Sophie? She is the only one that I never watched. She, I, I always see her on YouTube. She does some games and some things and gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So me and my uncle are going to go to the spot and we're going to show you. Come on. Okay, let's go and show them. <laughs> 